have your Bibles, would you turn to the 26th chapter of the book of Matthew. Tonight we're going to have a very special trio that we'll be singing. We have guests that are going to be here from various parts of the world. I will be speaking on the subject, Lessons from Gethsemane. Most of you that have been attending church know that for weeks I've been preaching concerning prayer Tonight, the Lord willing, we'll go into a very sacred place of prayer because there are lessons that all of us can learn. You see, that's a little unusual for Sunday night. I think you'll find it to be most appropriate. Lessons from Gethsemane. Now, in the 26th chapter of Matthew, verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be very sorrowful and very heavy or depressed. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep, and said unto Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. I don't know if I'm going to be successful, but I'd like for you to mark at least seven things in your Bible. And if you're seated next to someone who doesn't have a Bible, maybe you could share with them, and they'll get more out of it. There are two places that every Christian ought to go in our spiritual experience. One is the place called Calvary, and the other is the place Gethsemane. That's the reason I feel that the Lord has directed me to share two sermons today on prayer. Both of them will center around the place called Gethsemane. A place not very far outside the walls of the city of Jerusalem across the little brook Kidron. A beautiful little place where Jesus often resorted so that he might pray. It was a place of prayer for him. And I'd like to share with you some things concerning when Jesus prayed, because no mortal ever walked on this earth that knew the ministry and the power and the beauty of prayer like our Master knew how to pray. Let me suggest that you look at verses 36 and 37 and 38, and as we read those verses carefully, We will notice, and particularly when you look at verse 37, where it said concerning Jesus, that he began to be sorrowful and very depressed, very heavy of spirit. We can't help, in verse 38 he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. We can't help but recognize that Jesus prayed in weakness. Now isn't that amazing, that Jesus, the Son of God, would pray in weakness? He who created the heavens and the earth, he who had at his disposal an innumerable company of angels, that he would pray in weakness? 
Yet he did. Because here he is the Son of God, sorrowful. Here is the Son of God, depressed. Here is the Son of God, exceedingly sorrowful. If you read the same story in the Gospel of Luke, you'll find out that he became so weak that God sent an angel to strengthen him. Do you know that the favorite title by which Jesus went in his ministry was not the Son of God? It was not even teacher or rabbi or master, but he was called the Son of Man. He prayed in weakness because he who is very God became very man. And you can't separate the two. He took upon himself, the Apostle Paul said, the form of sinful flesh. He confined himself to the weakness of a mortal body. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And when we pause and reflect that when Jesus prayed, he prayed in weakness as a mortal man. Now I think that's significant because so often when you and I come to the place of prayer, we find ourselves possessed with the same problem, characterized by the same difficulty. Weakness, without strength, sometimes with sorrow, overwhelming sorrow, sometimes depressed, so much so that you can hardly breathe, so much so that, like the letter that I received from a lovely little lady from someplace across the community, and perhaps she's even in church today, and if she should be, I'm anxious to talk with her who said something like this in her letter, Pastor, I go to bed praying that I won't wake up in the morning. I get up in the morning anxious for the day to come to an end. Heaviness. So you see, Jesus prayed in weakness. Sometimes we're prone to think of the Master, and we can only see Him in His glory, and see Him in His power, see Him in His victory. And touch a blind eye and unstop a deaf ear. Walk on the water. Cause the lame to walk. Oh, we see him preaching to the multitude. And we're prone sometimes to think that our high priest does not understand how we feel. And yet the scriptures are clear. He was touched with the feelings of our weaknesses. If you're in church today and you're weak, and you're in an hour of sorrow, and you're depressed, and you're heavy. That's when Jesus prayed. And the same Father and the same God that heard the Son in the flesh pray has got an ear inclined to your voice. So don't excuse yourself from prayer because you're weak, because you're sorrowful, because you're depressed. That's the time to pray. Jesus prayed in his weakness. The second thing I want you to notice is this, and you'll find it so carefully exposed in verse 39. And he went a little further, further from the disciples, and he fell on his face. Isn't that amazing? He not only prayed in weakness, but now we see him praying in lowliness. Why, he was the master, Lord, King. For him to bow... Why, in one place it said, and he prostrated himself. Luke tells us that he prostrated himself before the Heavenly Father, that he fell on his face. Mark tells us that he kneeled and bowed his head. How did he pray? Oh, he prayed in lowliness. Not in arrogance. It wasn't a threat. It was the lowly Nazarene praying. I'm not suggesting that the only way we can pray is to kneel down because the position of the body really isn't all that important. God will hear us sitting just as well as he will kneeling. We can pray running or driving a car or going to school or 
like the fellow that fed, fell head first into the well. He prayed, wasn't the best position in all the world, but he was glad God heard him. That's not the position that's important, it's the attitude of heart that's so vitally important. And here was one who surely wasn't necessary for him to bow, to be lowly, but he was. No arrogance here, no self-assertion. Lowly fell before God. It was a matter of revering the Almighty. That's the reason I find myself getting a little anxious when people can so carelessly drag the name of Almighty into the mire and the mud of everyday living. Use His name as a byword. Cursed by His name and damned by His name. When here was Jesus of Nazareth who knew the glory of the Father for once was a part of the fullness of the glory of the Father. Now, in lowliness and contrition of heart and in humility, he bowed before the Father. There was something about the atmosphere that was supercharged with reverence when Jesus prayed. I trust that somehow God will so lead us into a prayer, into an atmosphere of prayer, that the very atmosphere around us will be charged with a reverence to God. There's ever been a day that we need it. We need it now, and it can happen when we prayed. It happened when He prayed. And it can happen when we pray. How did Jesus pray? Ah, uh, He prayed in weakness. And how did Jesus pray? He prayed in lowliness of spirit, humility of heart, humbled Himself before the Lord, fell on the ground and fell on His face, and said, Father... Will you hear your son? The third thing I want you to mark is this. It's in the same verse. You can mark three little words. Oh, my father. Can you imagine this? He was praying in dependence on the father. Now, you know, that, that doesn't really strike us until we realize who he really was. He who did not have to depend on anybody was now depending on his Father. He did not do anything without complete dependence on what the Father wanted. There was such an interaction and an inner relationship between Son and Father. No division of will. No separation of purpose. It was complete Subjection to, and honor of, and respect of, and dependence upon the Father. Now, I don't know if that means much to you or not, but so much of our prayers has, doesn't have that element in it. So much of our prayer is so selfish that it's 100% what we want and the way we want it figured out. And the first thing that Jesus did in his hour of weakness and in his moment of loneliness, he recognized his dependence on the Father. What are we little specks of dust to raise our fist and our voice to God and act independently of Him? Oh no, there is only power when we can say, Father, we're in this together. You're in me and I'm in you. What is it, Father? that you desire. Now we're moving on ground where God can begin to do something for us. Now God is not a push button that we go up and push so that come sliding down the slot can be something that we want. Father, I'm dependent upon you. I'm giving my life over to you. He who had the authority and the power to do something other than that subjected himself to it. Why? Because he was dependent on him. You see, I've been listening to prayer requests recently, more carefully than I've ever listened in my entire life. And I have been flabbergasted at the things that people want me to agree with in prayer. Until today, when people come to me and say, will you agree with me? 
I always look just a little carefully and say, I want to know what I'm agreeing about first. Because so much of our prayer does not have the element of our dependence upon God. Because if it did, so much of what we pray about, we wouldn't waste our time praying it. The fourth thing I want to share with you today, and I think in order for us to really catch it, you see this story is written in all of the Gospels, but in the 14th chapter of Mark, he states it even better than Matthew does. And Jesus said in verse 36, Abba, Father, and here's the phrase I want us to see, all things are possible unto thee. Now, draw, draw a line under that, because this brings us to this fourth element. Jesus prayed not only in weakness, He not only prayed in lowliness, He not only prayed in dependence upon God, but He prayed with the utmost of faith and confidence that God could do anything. He said, Father, there is nothing impossible with you. You see, the problem in getting an answer to prayer is not in the ability of God. If there's anything Jesus made clear, God had the ability. I had a professor in college that used to say, well, listen, God could get up in the morning and send an angel to come down and shave me. God's able to do that. And there have been mornings I wish He would. <laughs> and some of you look like He should have. There is no question about God's ability. Why, can you think of anything that God doesn't have the ability to do? He who backed up to nothing and spoke a world into existence? He who took his fingers and traced the rivers and pushed dirt up with his fingers and hands and made mountains? He who would fling birds into the sky and paint a sunset every evening? He could hang universes out on nothing and let them spin until to the nth part of a second they'll be on schedule. Is he short in ability? Is not all things possible? Don't you think that there could have been some way, somehow, that God in his great power could have come and simply snatched Jesus out so he would not have had to face the cup nor the cross. Oh, there was no question whatsoever in the ability of God to do it. Jesus said, Father, all things are possible with thee. That's not the problem in prayer. The problem of having confidence and faith over whether or not God can do it. Fact of the matter. We get no answer until we know that. Listen to what Paul says in the book of Hebrews. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Why, it does no good at all for us to pray unless we believe that with God all things are possible. You say, Brother Peter, do you think it's possible for God to raise the dead? Yes. Do you believe it's possible, Brother Pino, for God to create money and let it fall down out of the heavens? Yes. Do you believe, Brother Pino, that God is able to do so many things that He could just close this? Oh, yes. Close the lily. There's no need to even come to the Father unless we have that kind of faith. Why, if we've got a little puny God that's limited, He can only do certain things. No need to pray to him. Why, he's no better off than I am. There are some things I can do. Well, I do things all the time God doesn't do. I get up and shave every morning. God doesn't do that. You say you're being silly. No, no. If we have a God that can't do everything, if we don't have a God that and have that kind of faith in God, then we don't have a God that can do anything. That's the reason in the middle of his weakness, in the hour of his sorrow, 
in the time of his dependence, he said, Father, you can do all things. I don't know what might happen to me. I don't know what circumstances I may find myself. I don't know how much I may cry out. But there's one thing I want you to know today that I am convinced by the authority of the Word of God, witnessed to by the Holy Ghost, that God can do anything. I have no fuss with that. I have people that come up often and say, Brother Penner, do you think God can do this? My answer is yes. God, I can do If you can think it up, God can do it. He can do some things you can't even think of. So that's number four. Did you get it? I want you to be sure you're marking this. Prayed in weakness. Prayed in lowliness and reverence. Prayed in dependence upon His Father. Prayed with faith and confidence that His Father could do all things without limitation. And then in Matthew 26, look at verse 41. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Sometimes we read what Jesus said to the disciples that went asleep. And all we can read into it is rebuke. But if you'll read all three accounts, particularly of that part of the story, you'll find out that that's not what Jesus did at all. Jesus came and he was moved with compassion when he saw those three disciples that had fallen fast asleep when they should have prayed. He said, look, I want you to know that I'm aware that your flesh is weak, even though your spirit is willing. I also want you to know that I am praying because the hour of test and temptation is coming to you. Can you believe this? That Jesus, facing the darkest hour of his own life, was praying with compassion for somebody else? Now listen, I'm giving us principles about praying. If we're so overwhelmed with our own problem, and our own weakness, and our own inabilities, and our own desire, that we can't pray for somebody else, we're not praying the way Jesus prayed. That's the reason we've been calling people to the ministry of intercessory prayer. That's the reason we want to go into the church. Do you know we've said enough about it that already dozens of calls are coming to this church from people we know nothing about at all. Never seen them, never heard their name. They've never been in the church. They have simply begun to find out, find out that there are people that are coming to Calvary Temple that are willing to pray with compassion and to pray for someone else. And I've got a stack of prayer requests in my drawer in my desk now from people that I don't know anything at all about that simply say, pray. I had a woman to call today and she was weeping till I could hardly understand her on the phone. And she said, Pastor Pano, I've never been to your church. I don't know anything about it. I do listen on the radio. And I'm asking you to please pray. I understand you folks pray. Jesus prayed with compassion. He was concerned about his own need. But here were three that he knew was going through a tremendous testing hour. And he said, I pray that you'll be strengthened in the hour of testing. That's how he prayed. With compassion. Anybody can come with judgment. Anybody can say it's good enough for you. Anybody can say I knew they had it coming. God give us men and women that will pray as Jesus prayed, with compassion. Verses 37, 38, and 39, there is a mention of one little three-letter word has to do with cup. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Now what did the cup represent? Listen, the cup represented sorrow. The cup represented suffering. The cup represented agony. The cup represented death. Father, is it possible for this cup to pass from me? If not, I'll drink it to its bitter dregs. There are some people, and there is a philosophy, and again today, I want to spike it if I can. There is a philosophy that's 
crept among some of God's people, and especially in full gospel circles, that we can live in a place where we will be excluded from pain and hurt and suffering. It's impossible for that to happen if we're going to pray the way Jesus prayed. Because the cup that was proffered to the Lord was a cup of suffering. It was a cup of anguish. It was a cup of pain. It was a cup of sorrow. Ah, he who is the captain of our salvation learned obedience by the things he suffered. Christians are not made strong in the sunshine. They're made strong in the dark hour. Faith is not built when things go well. Faith is strengthened when there's opposition. Men are not dedicated to the cause of God when God is in a free handout program to His children. But men become strong in God when they have to lean heavily on God. And if we're going to know what prayer is, listen to what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3. He said, if you're going to know me in the power of my resurrection, you must also know me in the fellowship of my suffering. That's the reason you don't find very many people going very deep in prayer. Because you won't go long in prayer. You look at the great prayer warriors that we have any history about at all. I'm thinking of David Brainerd who prayed that God would give revival to the Indians. They found him dead praying. He had prayed with such agony of spirit that he died in the process. You say, that's silly, is it? Jesus drank the cup. Listen to the Apostle Paul. He prayed with such agony for Israel that he said, I have prayed that I could be accursed if Israel could be saved. Don't tell me that's not agony. I'm willing. Listen to what he said on another occasion in the book of Galatians. He said, I have travailed in prayer that Christ would be formed in you. And that travail, that word means I have gone through birth pains, the suffering of birth pains, that you could be born into the kingdom. How many of us have ever suffered in prayer? God would do something. I'm simply telling you today, that's the way Jesus prayed. We think prayer is some little nicey-nice something that we do before we eat a meal. Or something that politicians do a week before election. I didn't know we had so many spiritual people running for office until this week. I've got them wanting to make appointments with me. People that wouldn't even speak to me ordinarily. Now they want an appointment. Say, say something nice to me about me over the pulpit so people can vote for me. Say, who are you going to vote for? The Lord's by judge. I don't know. You can put both of them in a bag and shake the bag. I don't know who'd fall out first. <laughs> say, oh, I'm against you now. Well, I'll tell you who to vote. Vote for him. It'll be all right. And while I'm on the subject, do go out and vote for somebody. It's a privilege we got as an American. If you don't know, go in there and pray and say, Lord, help me, and pull a lever for somebody. <laughs> don't sit home and not do it. We, we got an opportunity to cast a vote. Say, we're going to waste it. No, you won't. Vote for somebody. I listened to that fellow last night talking about the American party, and he's about, he's about the only guy that makes any sense in the whole bunch. <laughs> I don't know how I got from prayer off onto that. But I am saying this, that there is an agony that's connected with praying. There is a suffering that's connected with praying. If we really pray the way Jesus prayed. You talk about agony and praying, he prayed until he perspired drops of blood from his body. 
which indicates that he prayed with a broken heart. Pray. He prayed with such force and such agony of heart that God let an angel stand next to him and strengthen him while he prayed. Have we ever begun to pray? You say, oh, but he was God. No, wait a minute. He was the Son of Man. He was very poor. He died. He wore a house just like we wear one of flesh and blood and bones. Pray. I don't know how far God's going to lead us. I don't know how far we're going to let God lead us. But I'm going to say this, that the most powerful force on the face of the earth today, praying people that are really praying. And I believe it's where God wants to lead us. That's the sixth thing. And now the seventh and last. Verse 42. Oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it. And I took a red pencil and I drew a circle around the next four words. The hardest words that a Christian can ever speak. Oh, we can say them, but I mean say them from our heart. Thy will be done. You say, Brother Pano, I'm a Christian and I'm going through hell on earth in my home. Do you think I ought to leave my husband? Do you think I ought to leave my wife? No. You say, have you got Bible for that? Yes, the Bible says if the unbelieving wants to remain, you let him stay. I didn't say that. I'm just reporting. You see, but you don't know what kind of a skunk he is. God knows. Thy will be done. I had a little girl come in the office yesterday and says, Brother Painter, what do you think? I'm about to marry someone. I'm thinking about marrying someone. I said to her, well, let me ask you something. Is he a Christian? No. Does he go to church? No, he doesn't like for me to come. He says, does he drink? He says, well, yes, drinks a lot. I said, how much a lot? He said, well, he gets drunk. I said, do you think it's going to be better when you marry him? She said, well, I was hoping you'd tell me he would. So I got bad news for you. It's not God's will for you to marry him. Period. That's it. So, but I love him. That doesn't change God's will. So I don't like that kind of preaching. I know. That doesn't change a word any. Thy will be done. I have people come into my office, and not just young, come into my office involved in things they shouldn't be involved in, and you look at them and say, well, hey, wait a minute, I want to ask you something. What does the Word say? Is, oh, well, I know what the Word says, but i got news for you. The buts that are involved have nothing to do with it. What does God say? Thy will be done. Was it easy? Oh, no, no. But there was no victory. You say, oh, God will forsake me. Will he? Ah, oh, in an hour when it looked like that he would indeed be forsaken, and there was a brief moment when Jesus himself said, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? And with that there came a clap of God's power. And he who suffered unto death knew the glory that he once had with the Father because he said, Thy will be done, not mine. It's the toughest words you'll ever utter. I don't know about you, but I'm a self-willed person. Stubborn. 
A lot of times God can't reason with me. He's got to knock the fire out of me. That's the reason I have some tough times to say, Oh, Brother Pino, you've gone through some experiences. Yes. Do you know why? Because I'm hard-headed. God knows that. He can shake the liver out of you, brother. That's why I say, Father, all right, your will be done. And then it all happens and you wonder, Why didn't I say yes to God in the first place? Submission. Thy will be done. Do we still want to go into a prayer ministry? Are we still interested in the church being called a praying church? Do we want to be a part of that kind of a thing? Or is it just too heavy? Too much? Preacher, I think I'll find someplace else. That's just too heavy for me. Praying the way Jesus prayed. That's the reason He came and dwelt among us. So we'd know how to live the way He lived. Let's pray. Tonight, the Lord willing, I want to take you back to Gethsemane and share with you seven lessons that God taught me from Gethsemane. You say, you're going to repeat what you said. You come and find out. Dear Lord, so much of our prayer is so shallow. So empty. Lord, a lot of us even foolish. Teach me to pray. Teach your people to pray. Teach us to pray. Lead us, Lord, into a ministry of prayer. We don't want to play church. We don't want to go through a form and a ceremony. Just go through a little nice religious exercise. Oh, Lord, if we know our hearts, we want to come into those spiritual experiences that you've got for your children. Teach us to pray as we ought. Come to you, Lord, in weakness. Come to you lowly and reverent knowing that with you all things are possible. There's nothing impossible with you, Lord. Pray that you'd teach us to be submissive to thee and yielded to thee. Fill our hearts with compassion and lead us into the place of prayer, to Gethsemane. If there be someone in the room today that's really been struggling with your will. Bring us, Lord, to that place where we will say and mean it, Thy will be done. And walk out of here, Lord, with the whole thing in your hands. I pray in Christ's name. Let's all stand together and let's sing, Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Have thine own one another but how many before the Lord today can say Lord I I want you to teach me to pray as you would have me to pray would you put your hand up say I really want that I really want that you know God knows your heart he knows my heart I believe that's the reason he's calling us how many think the preacher ought to keep preaching about prayer Amen. amen it's something we can all do no exclusions Everybody in this room can enter into this ministry. Not everybody can sing like Jeff, play the piano the way these musicians can play. 
But thank God we can all pray. Sing it one last time, all right? Have thy no close of every service. We won't be doing this on and on. One of these days we'll get moved into the new building and it'll be finished. Then we'll move into something else. But we're going to build on the building. We're trying to get into it in the next two or three weeks. And man, we need you to help us build on the building today. So look, I don't know what you've got. I said Thursday night you don't have anything else but a button. Bring it, you know. If that's all you got, just bring it and put it in. We need you to bring about someplace between five and six thousand dollars for the building this morning. Will you bring something as an expression of faith? All right. Let's let's sing. I keep falling in love with him. And uh, now, don't get so enthused about singing that you forget to bring your part on the building. All right. You folks in the balcony, come on, you get started now so you can get down here before I dismiss. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over.